You're listening to the Fertility Docs Uncensored Podcast, featuring insight on all things fertility from some of the top-rated doctors around America. Whether you're struggling to conceive or just planning for your future family, we're here to guide you every step of the way. Today's podcast is brought to you by Ovation Fertility, a leader in the field of IVF lab services. Ovation partners with some of America's leading fertility specialists to provide a range of services to support fertility treatment, including fertility testing, IVF, egg donation, surrogacy, genetic testing, and long-term storage of reproductive material. You can learn more about Ovation at OvationFertility.com. Hello, this is Dr. Carrie Bedient here with another episode of Fertility Docs Uncensored. I am joined by my two fabulous, stunningly beautiful, marvelous, delightful co-hosts, Dr. Abby Evelyn from Nashville Fertility Center. Hi, everybody. And Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center. Hello. And we are joined today by Heidi Hayes, who we are really, really excited to have on. She is with Donor Egg Bank and actually founded Donor Egg Bank, or Deb is the shorthand, and has a lot of personal experience as well as professional experience with the world of having other people help you build your family. So we're going to dive into that. And and we are very excited to have someone who knows that world inside and out from all of the corners and all of the angles. But Heidi, you have fun hobbies because you said that you work with stained glass. And how does that work? Oh my gosh. First of all, let me say, Abby, Susan, Carrie, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I, I actually started to do stained glass Oh, probably about 15 years ago. And I love to do like flowers and I make little gifts and it takes some time. It, it takes a moment of patience that I think quiets my mind and helps me to calm down and relax because there's so much going on in my day. What's the process of making stained glass? Well, first of all, you start with different colored glass. You cut the glass as close. Like if I'm doing a flower, I do circles. So as close to a circle as you can, but then you have to grind it down. Those are hard though. Straight lines are easier. (laughs) Exactly. Use like a wet grinder to grind it down. Then you wrap it with foil and then you put lead on top of it. Use like a a gun that will heat up the lead and help it to melt. And that's what holds all the little foiled pieces together. So do you make the colored glass or do you buy the colored glass? I buy it. Okay. It's such a great hobby to have because if you need a little gift, once you kind of have all the stuff and can do it, it's like, I mean, you can do something pretty fast and everybody's just like so amazed by it, you know, but is this stuff that you can have at home? Yes, we do it right here at the house. The reason I stopped doing it was because I had little people running around. And as you can imagine, when you're cutting glass and you're grinding glass, lots of shards of glass around. And that's when I I haven't done it in a long time. I'm about to be an empty nester. So I may take that up again. (laughs) When I was a kid, I had a friend whose mom did stained glass. And that was actually my memory of their house was she did it near the kitchen area. And like, I remember you did not run around barefoot at their house because of her hobby. And it was like one of those like momentous, like memory things. It's, it's kind of cool. So Heidi, what's the, like the biggest or coolest thing you've made out of stained glass? So I actually did my kitchen cabinet at a prior house. Whoa. Wow. And uh, entered them into an award for the state of Maryland and actually won a prize. So I felt so accomplished. How cool. That's super cool. So what did you do? Like, did you do patterns on the, the windows or just different colors or how did you do that? I did kind of like purplish and pink irises. They were really pretty on the upper cabinets. How cool. So did they build the cabinet around the stained glass that you made? No, we, we took out the, the center panel. Uh-huh. We removed that center panel. And then after I had created the stained glass, we used like a glue gun type concept, but like a construction type gun to hold it in place. Gotcha. That's really cool. I kind of live and desire being able to do that kind of creative stuff with my own house and don't have most of the skills that you would need to do any of the types of things that I actually want to do. But one day I will acquire them because both you and Abby are giving me hope that I can learn some of these skills with, you know, I'm thinking about all this woodworking stuff that I want to do. But if you guys can learn to do stained glass, then I can learn to, you know, build crazy shelves and all of those things that I want to do. All right. So Susan, do you have questions of the day for us? We do. Okay. Our first question is, I'm a 35-year-old female that has one block tube. 
Luckily, I was blessed with a little boy in 2020 via IVF. I'm curious on fallopian tubes and how they become blocked and why it is not common to try to unblock the tubes. The end of the fallopian tubes are the one thing in your pelvis that's the, probably the most delicate thing there. So anything that causes inflammation in the environment, like if you've had previous surgeries, one of the big red flags for us is if you've had an appendix that has ruptured particularly, that tends to cause lots of inflammation. Anything that causes an abscess or pus, almost invariably, and unfortunately, I recently had a patient who had really big damaged block tubes because of that similar situation. She had pus in her pelvis and unbeknownst to her and had been that way for many years, her tubes were blocked and dilated. Um, infections can also cause that. And a lot of times, whatever damages one tube damages the other tube. And so we tend to see that both of the tubes are blocked and occasionally it'll be just one tube. Those are the main reasons why I think people get blocked fallopian tubes. The infections that we're usually the most concerned about are gonorrhea and chlamydia. And as strange as it sounds, it, it's actually usually better if somebody gets gonorrhea because they have lots of green, nasty discharge. And so they go to the doctor and they get treated relatively quickly. Whereas chlamydia, often people are very, very asymptomatic. And so people can have infections for long times and potentially even clear that infection on their own. And so have no realization of that they had that infection in the past. Other things that can add to it, endometriosis. Sometimes when people have types of inflammatory bowel disease, um, we see pelvic scarring, different things like that. And sometimes we just don't have an explanation. I mean, I always like to say that we live in a world where we can Google why the sky is blue. And so not having that reason is sometimes a, a hard pill to take, but it just unfortunately is what it is. And so we have good treatments to work around it. But along that line, Carrie, do you want to address why we don't often unblock tubes nowadays? Yeah. So there's a couple of reasons. One is that tubes are not like plumbing. You cannot just run a roto reader through that, remove the clog and be good to go. This is not equivalent to that because when you look at a tube, there's two things you want to look at. One is something we can test for, which is just, is the tube open or not? And that we get the HSG, we get the hycosis that tells us, is there passage of fluid through the tube? Is it open or not? That's only part of the story because the other part of the story is the internal architecture. And there's all these little hairs on the inside of the tube. They need to function in order to push the sperm and the egg together and then back down to the uterus where there's plenty of room for a baby to grow. That is not repairable. That is what it is. And unfortunately, we don't know whether that in architecture is intact or not. Certainly, if someone has a hydrocell pinks or fluid filled tube, we think, all right, probably not. But there's no way for us to repair that. And similarly, when you go in to fix something, like if someone has had their tubes tied, for example, where they thought they were done having babies, there was a deliberate, usually cut and burn in the middle of the tubes and come off of it. In order to fix that, you have to cut the affected areas out and sew them back together. There's a couple issues with that. The cuts that you're making are going to cause damage on their own right. You hope it's not very much, but it's inherently a damaging scar inducing process and you don't know the extent to the injury. And that's only in a case where you have a really known, I know why these tubes are blocked. Most of the time, we don't know why the tubes are blocked. So there's not a place where we can go to cut it out and, and tie it back together and, and make it work. Um, and with IVF having such high success rates, it means that it usually makes more sense to bypass the tubes completely than it does to repair them, have a lower chance of success and a higher chance of a, a future ectopic pregnancy. And so the risks being increased, the chance of success being decreased and the inability to really address the root problem is typically why there's not very many people who go after repairing tubes these days. Maybe 15 or 20 years ago, we were a lot more apt to do that because IVF numbers, like Carrie said, were success rates were not as good as they are now. The other big issue back then would be, you know, you go in to fix the tube and if you're trying to create a whole new opening at the end of the fallopian tube, once you repair it, those edges are inflamed and it was always upsetting when you do all this surgery and then you look six months later, a few months later, and the tube would be blocked again. And so for all those reasons now with the good success that we have with IVF, we generally try and bypass the tubes and, and do IVF. All right. We have one more question. I have poor egg quality and have been put on a cocktail of supplements. Is this actually going to work or am I spending even more money on these pills just to be let down again? I'm feeling defeated. 
All of us have really sad faces right now. We do. Yes. We all feel you. Um, When you're looking at the supplements and, and kind of cocktails that people use for decreased egg reserve, most of them fall into not scientifically proven to make huge amounts of difference. Now, there's a an upside to that and there's a downside to that. On the one hand, most of us live by, you know, data-driven medicine where you want a good study to show that something's going to make a difference or it's not so you know where to spend your time, your money and, and efforts. On the other hand, you can't do a study for absolutely everything. And so there are medications that we use in the fertility field where we're like, you know what, this is probably not going to hurt. It very well may help. Let's do that. When you're working with decreased egg quality, it's a position where everybody is trying to help in the best way possible. And sometimes that means adding in a bunch of cocktails, um, whether that's, you know, growth hormone or CoQ10 or, or whatever it may be. And, and every doctor has something a little bit different. Nobody's got a smoking gun. You know, nobody knows absolutely, oh, if you give this, then it's going to be better. It's unlikely to hurt. You know, usually it's just the financial component that is the most painful of it. And there's the component of hope as well of like, you know, Hey, we got to try again. And sometimes it's merely the act of trying again, that makes the difference. And people are more willing to try again, if you're doing something different. And and sometimes people are more willing to try again, if you don't do anything different, because it's less expensive. Like there's a bunch of different ways you can spin this, you know, typically we know if you don't try again, it's not going to work. So try again and, you know, don't give up, keep on going. and, And I hope the best for you. And, you know, I agree there, there's the data is really not there for most supplements. I think if you were a researcher right now, the NIH is funding or trying to fund studies looking at fertility and supplements. But, you know, the data is not there, but, you know, it might be there at some point. And so, like Carrie said, we kind of feel like some of the supplements we recommend, like coenzyme Q10, probably don't hurt anything and may help. And so, you know, why not try them? All right. So, Heidi, we have been super excited to talk to you because you have... Number one, founded a a phenomenal company with egg donation. And you have also gone through some of that journey yourself personally. And can you give us kind of the overview for our listeners of what your journey has been? Sure. Like many of your listeners, my husband and I started with, you know, IUIs and IVF. And we did all of that in our early 30s. And by the time I had done 10 uh, cycles, unsuccessful and had two miscarries, you know, I really felt like it wasn't going to work for me. And I was 33 when we started and I was about 36 when we jumped off that train and said, it's not going to work. And at that time, my doctor recommended we consider donor egg, but I had this concept in my head that it was just me. I'd had two miscarries. It must be my uterus. I can't carry a baby. And so I thought, why would that work for me when my eggs won't work? And so we decided to do an adoption. I was so fearful of having somebody take my baby that we went and did an international adoption. We got a little boy out of Guatemala. He was adorable. And um, a couple of years later, we went back because it worked to get a little girl. And that's when I learned the real hard lesson that there's no perfect solution to building a family. We got caught with the Hague Agreement, the Hague Accord that came through Guatemala shut down. We were one of 5,000 families trying to get our baby. And we lost our baby as family number. I think we were 27 when we lost our child. Oh, wow. We tracked her for six years. And in the meantime, I had started working in fertility and had a great doctor who said, Heidi, you are so unresolved. You are meant to be a mom again. You should do donor egg. And that's when I got educated. Did you have evidence of diminished ovarian reserve or just unsuccessful cycles and a couple of miscarriages? Unsuccessful cycles and miscarries to the point where one of my cycles, we actually transferred four blastocysts. (gasps) Wow. Yes. And I still didn't get pregnant. So I think that In my early 30s, you know, this was before they were doing AMH routinely. There was some evidence that this was probably a combination of the quality of my eggs and perhaps, you know, the the quality of the laboratory in which I was seeing as well. Because, you know, when I think back, my son is 16. Now it's been nearly 20 years. You know, IVF wasn't what it is today. No, it wasn't. You're right. 
So we ended up deciding to move forward with donor egg uh, with the encouragement of the doctor who said it was probably not my uterus. It was probably the quality of the eggs that I was producing. And so I was afraid we were broken. And I say that in the fact of we had failed IUI, we had failed IVF, and we had a failed adoption. That's like the last option, (laughs) you know? So we decided to move forward with donor egg. And I always like to share that I had at the time, the head of the lab, the best doctor, everybody rooting for me. And I had these two crappy looking day three embryos that the polar body wasn't where it was supposed to be. And everyone was prepping me for the failure of of that cycle. And so we did transfer both of those day three embryos. Again, my children are all 12. So that's in a day we were doing day three transfers routinely. And everybody freaked out when I got the first beta and everybody worried that I was having triplets. (laughs) Oh, what a great story. Yes. Now, when you went through with donor eggs, um, you know, nowadays we live in the world of fresh versus frozen. What was your world like at that time? You could only do a fresh transfer. My children were born in 2009. So Donor Egg Bank USA, we actually started to talk about launching in early 2011 is when we created the company. And at that time, very few locations in the United States were able to successfully freeze an egg. So we didn't have that option. It didn't really become a non-experimental procedure until I think 2012. You were on the cutting edge of all of this. That's correct. We were at ASRM and we had done 26 transfers across multiple locations. And it felt like we were on the red carpet. Everybody was snapping photos (laughs) and they were so excited. And now I look back at it, knowing that we've done over 11,000 People were so excited to see 26. It was so new. That's funny. So can you speak to the emotions of trying to make that decision to use donor eggs? Because I see patients quite often that, you know, they're sort of in a similar situation. They feel like they're at the end of the road. And when I bring up, you know, I always say, you know, I just want you to know it's out there, but this may or may not be something that's right for you. And I talk about donor eggs. And, you know, the first response, I think, with 99% of my patients is like, no way, I can never do that. And then for some of those patients over time, they think about it and they weigh their options. And then I see them again. And so speak to me a little bit about kind of what your emotions were at that point. When we went back and talked to the doctor and they said, donor egg, my husband was ready to go. He was completely on board. It took me nearly a year to be to the point where I could do it. I think that as a woman, as a girl, I had, you know, believed in the children that I would have, you know, even though I had adopted, I I went into that knowing that none of those genetics would be mine. And it was really one statement that took me over that edge. And the doctor said, the donor is only going to give you one cell. And it's a very special cell, but you will make and weave together the baby. Oh, that's beautiful. I like that. It's when I recognized that my husband and I were going to meet each other halfway. He would have the genetic connection, but I would make the baby and have that opportunity to be pregnant. And that's what actually got me on board. I think it's healthy for couples that have had an infertility journey to take time to grieve their, I say grieve their genetics, grieve that loss, because you're then able to move forward with donor egg and to be able to embrace it in a really positive, excited way. So what were the differences you found emotionally between comparing the adoption process? Because that's a lot of people, when they're naively going into it, they think like, oh, I'm going to sign up with an adoption agency. And then, you know, three months, six months, however many months later, um, I'm going to have a baby and this is, and then we're going to do this. And I think once people get into it and they realize like, oh, this is not that straightforward. How did you go about each part of that journey? Yeah, it's a whole lot of work. And they do call it paper pregnant. It's nothing to go into lightly. The rules and regulations vary by every county. Some of it is craziness. We had to have someone come in and inspect our home. We had to change the locks on our door. We had to take a window and make it lower. It was too high up. It didn't meet code. I mean, it was 
all the hoops you jump through for an adoption in your home study and people look into every part of you. They look into your finances and into your ability to be a parent, your psyche. And now you have to actually go through classes before you can adopt. Uh huh. Wow. So there's a lot that goes into that process. When I compare adoption and donor egg, adoption is far more difficult, I believe, because you're holding on to a hope for us. Ultimately, we got a picture and then we held on to this picture. Or if you find out that you've been matched, somebody chose you. Today, if you're doing a domestic adoption, you create what's called a life book. And then individuals, birth moms will make the decision on if they're going to choose you. So it's competitive in order to be chosen. It's like an audition. Exactly. And to me, that's stressful and nerve wracking. And am I good enough? And it speaks to that. What I loved about Donor Egg is it was the first time in my fertility journey that I was actually in control. That is so well said. I I think that's one of the things that even when we're looking at fresh versus frozen eggs, I have so many more patients who choose frozen eggs because they're like, I want to take out the guesswork. I want to take out as much of the possibility of things not turning out the way I want as possible. Yeah. And I like the fact that I was able to choose the donor. I didn't have to wait for the donor to choose me and I could do it on my own time. And like with frozen eggs, you can even determine when you want them warmed. You can even plan that transfer to the date. (laughs) That's a good point. So it is really wonderful, I think, to feel like you have that control. And then with an adoption, birth mothers do change their mind. And so every state has a different law and how long she has to change her mind. And she can do it during the pregnancy. She can do it after the pregnancy. With a donor egg, once you do the transfer, you have the dreaded two-week wait. But it's two weeks. You know you're going to get through it. It's finite and it makes it easier. That's huge. So what have the conversations with your kids been about how they came into this world? Because they're 12 and 16 at this point. So they're old enough to have started to have some of those conversations. Yes, we've actually talked to all of our children from the very beginning. So I never wanted there to be a day in which they had the talk and and they knew that was the day they'd learned. My oldest, we had a a book of him, you know, his adoption of us, you know, at the airport. And he's got a little piece of paper that said baby's first flight. So that was much more evident. But I do remember when he was nine years old, when he discovered, he put it together and he knew that he was adopted and he knew what it meant. And we had a major meltdown and we went into counseling within a week and just helped him process what that meant. And then my my youngest, our donor egg conceived, and I've been able to actually utilize part of the adoption story to help them understand their story. And that normalized my oldest son being adopted because it kind of put them uniquely in our own family, we're able to do that, that puts them all a very similar siblings. So not one's better than the other. It's just I got to carry that pregnancy versus my first child that is adopted. But none of my three children share my genetics. With your 12-year-olds, you're probably not old enough really to kind of know about the genetic possibilities and to know about things like Ancestry.com and 23andMe. But I'm sure you've thought about those things. And probably with some of the women that you've worked with, you've talked about that. How are you going to handle that when they get to the age where they say, you know, I really like to check and see if I have any siblings or, you know, if I can find the person who donated this egg or my egg or. Well, actually, Abby, we actually do know who our donor is. Our donor, very unique kind of situation. My mother's very much into ancestry. So we all got our ancestry kits for Christmas. <laughs> Probably it's been about four or five years ago. And we knew via the DNA kit who the donor was, but we signed a contract and we signed not to reach out to that donor and we didn't. And then it was about a year and a half to two years ago that I ended up with this Instagram message to me that said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to follow you. (laughs) And it was our donor. So she knew about you and you knew about her. (laughs) But neither one of us was talking to each other because we were both honoring our contract. 
But we ended up connecting and she's just an absolutely delightful, amazing individual. What's unique about that is that there is a desire, I think, more on their side of the family that they would love to connect with us. But everyone respects the children. And my youngest two, they know that she's a donor. They've never seen her picture. They haven't wanted to. So I'm just sitting back and letting them decide if they want to and when they want to, and they may never want to. And that's uniquely their story that they get to write that chapter in their story versus uh, me or the donor making those decisions for them. But from time to time, I have had, uh, particularly my daughter, we've gone through some health challenges and I've been able to reach out to the donor and ask questions. And that's been really great in, in identifying that the challenges that she's having are actually genetic. And that's brought some source of comfort to know, okay, it's genetic. Oh, wow. In this entire process, there are definitely shades of gray. And it's okay. I mean, and I think that's one important thing for our listeners to know is it's okay to live within those shades of gray. It's okay for you to have information and not necessarily your children at this moment in time based on their desires to have that information. And you were commenting earlier about the difference between privacy and secrecy. Can you explain that? Yes. I decided early on, actually, I had the situation in which I was going through the donor egg process and a very close friend of mine commented to me that she was just starting IVF herself. And she said, oh my gosh, my doctor actually even said donor egg to us. And I thought, Absolutely not. I could never do that, she said. And I said, why? And she said, because it'd be like my husband sleeping with another woman. And I thought, oh, (laughs) okay. And this was my very close friend. And I've never had that view. But I do bring it up because I have actually had some women say that to us on the phone. So I know it is a fear that some women have. It's not one that I personally had. But that's when I decided that Although she's a best friend, I don't feel the need to tell her. And that's when I decided I'm private about it. I don't have to tell people how my children were conceived. No one walks up to the other woman in the supermarket and say, oh, did you have her via C-section? I mean, that's not part of the conversation, right? Yeah. So why should I have to offer it up? But I'm also not secret about it. So there is another individual in our Bible talk who said to me, Heidi, I know you work with Donor Egg Bank USA. Did you have your children via donor egg? And I said, yes, I did. And I thought, if you ask me straight out, I'm not going to be secret about it because I'm proud of how I had my children. I want them to be proud of their birth story and their conception story. We're not here to convince people if we made our family the right way or the wrong way based on their own individual beliefs. But I want my children to be well grounded with pride and how they were conceived within our family unit. I think that's fabulous. As reproductive endocrinologists, we know how a number of babies are conceived, obviously. And Abby and Carrie live in very large cities. I live in a much smaller community. And it's not unusual that I'll be out to dinner with my family or shopping at the mall or, you know, doing something and somebody comes up and, you know, shares their baby and, and it's great. But I always tell somebody whenever they're talking to me about my job and we start going down the path of talking about stuff like donor egg or donor sperm or anything like that, that jokingly, but in all seriousness, I never, ever say your baby looks like you unless I was involved in the conception (laughs) (laughs) because it's way more common than people expect. And you may have a friend whose children were conceived with some sort of third party reproduction and You may not be privy to the story, but if you're going through your fertility journey, you may not be the only person in your life considering, considered, or going down the path of using donor egg. That's correct. And for anyone that's thinking about using donor eggs, you know, there's that moment in which you do it. There is probably one or two times that I can think of that I had a moment after my children were conceived that I 
had just a moment and like a fleeting moment of just sadness that, that we had to go that direction, that that's what we did. But I never remember that they're donor egg and neither does anyone else in my family. So I love my mother. She just cracks me up because when my daughter was young, she had these curls and my mom would constantly say, you know, she gets those after your grandmother. (laughs) Everybody forgets. Nobody. They're just family. Exactly. They're your children and you wouldn't have it any other way. I tell patients a lot of times I'll I'll call patients after they've had their baby. And most of the time, without even talking about how the child was conceived, my patient will say, you know, Dr. Evelyn, I don't know why I didn't do this sooner. When I look at my baby, all I see is my sweet little baby. And I don't think about the genetics. And, And I'm sure as life goes on, you think less and less about the genetics, you know. So I was trying to say that to encourage patients. And I'm sure for you, you can you've just spoken this, what a journey it was for you to get there and how difficult it is to make that final decision. But what a joy your children have been to you and how you probably wouldn't want to ever have it any other way than you had it. No, no. And when I say like a fleeting moment, the last time my children are 12, the last time I had a fleeting moment, they were probably like two or they were like 18 months. Like it was very early on in that process. And another thing I I should just share that I meant to share when we were talking about adoption and donor egg and those two is that With the adoption, I found it took much longer to bond. Typically with an adoption, they say it can take up to a year to 18 months to bond uh, with a child. And with donor egg, that bonding actually happens in utero. Possibly it wouldn't happen in utero with somebody that's, you know, utilizing a gestational carrier. But if you're actually carrying the baby, the bonding happens when you're pregnant and it's much easier to bond. I would definitely believe that. I mean, going through all of the trials and tribulations of pregnancy, even when it's a good, easy pregnancy, I mean, it is not an easy thing to carry this basketball around on your front that is making you pee every 25 minutes (laughs) and causing hormonal swings. And there's all of the attendant fears of parenthood of what happens next? Am I going to do this? Okay. Am I going to screw this kid up? Are they going to be all right? To like all of the thoughts of parenthood that just explode within your brain. I don't think I had ever really thought about how long it would take to bond with an adopted child versus one that you carry, but that's not surprising to hear you say that at all. And particularly child that speaks a different language too, has heard a different language his whole life. Well, I also had seen that some of the other women that I talked to that also adopted, I think Many of us were afraid that the adoption would fall through, that we didn't prepare. And so you find out that the baby's ready. And then you realize, I remember my husband and I had to run out. We're like, we bought the crib right off the floor because like there was no time to order anything, right? I bought like little pajamas. And when I got to Guatemala, other people had like cute little booties and stuff, but we were not prepared because we were afraid to fail. Uh Mm -hmm. We were afraid to hope so much that it would actually work. And I think that's also unique to people that have gone through a fertility journey versus those that have decided just to move forward with an adoption. I imagine you get to kind of go through some of that processing when you're pregnant with a child conceived from a donor egg. You're processing some of those things while you're pregnant. So it you have a little more kind of active healing time I, without a better way of saying it. Yeah. And also when you hit that hurdle of like 24 weeks, when you're like, okay, like it's, we're viable, like we could make it. You still have time at that point to kind of put everything else together. So, and, and I also like to tell people when I think about adoption, I had a revelation when we went back to consider donor egg is that if you're trying to adopt a baby, you want in your heart to feel like it's altruistic. But the truth of the matter is there's 100 people lined up right behind you for that same baby. You know, it's really a matter of supply and demand. There is a lot of demand for a baby that's up for adoption and there's a very little supply of babies until they hit about age two. And at age two, there's a huge supply and very little demand. So I always like to tell people when they look at donor egg, if you have a heart for a child over the age of two, please don't do donor egg. Really seriously, always consider adopting because there's so many children out there that really have a need for a parent. And I run the Donor Egg Bank USA. (laughs) Good for you. 
how do we get our patients to the families they're really desperately hoping for? And for some patients, it's going to be IUI and IVF using their own eggs. For other patients, it's going to be donor egg. For other patients, it's going to be adoption. And, and there's going to be people who decide, you know what, we're done. We're, we're okay without having children. And all of those things take their own time to have the healing, to have the decision-making process, all of those things. So it's very helpful to have you talk to us today from that position of knowledge of knowing how the donors go through, how these eggs come to availability, and also the personal experience of this is what the couples who are trying to build these families go through as they're getting to this point. So thank you so much for sharing all of this. And I know you're you're a super busy woman running like crazy doing all of the things that you do. So we are grateful for your time. Thank you so much. It's been so great talking with you guys and just being able to share. I really hope that all of the men and women out there, all the people out there, I should even say, that want to have a baby, that you persevere and you keep your heart into it. Because when you finally get there and you will get there if you persevere, it's, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. You've got a great story, Heidi. Thank you so much, Heidi. All right. And to our audience, thank you so much for listening. Be sure to tune in next week for more. Be sure to subscribe, leave us a review in iTunes. We would love to hear from you. We're on Facebook and we're on Instagram. So hop on by and leave us a review. Send us a like, send us a follow and say hello. You can also visit us on fertilitydocsuncensored.com to submit specific questions. All questions will be answered on the podcast anonymously for the Ask the Doc segment, or even leave us an idea for an episode. So don't hold back. We'd love to hear from you. As always, this podcast is intended for entertainment and is not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. All right. We'll talk to y'all soon. Bye. 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 Today's podcast is also brought to you by Theralogics. Theranatal Fertility Supplement Ovavite includes optimal absorption CoQ10 formulated to support healthy egg quality in women going through IVF or any woman preparing for pregnancy in her 30s and beyond. Ovavite is independently tested and certified by NSF International.